beautiful fall day on our hands. Uh, it's not just birds that live in the uh, southern polar regions, many other creatures as well, like this sea otter. Looks pretty different from the, the river otters that we were looking at before. Come on in, take a seat. Uh, also have humpback whales uh, in, in these seas. Uh, rarely do you see the whole whale, probably the most Recognizable thing is the uh, barnacle encrusted tail. Also have uh, big, big seals. These are fur seals. A uh, uh, nice uh, ecological story. These were almost hunted to extinction, but they've made a, a strong comeback since uh, humans have less, fewer uses for seal fur these days. Uh, these are so the the large male seals. Uh, and they, they like to stake their claim on the beach, which means that they will uh, get into a bit of a disagreement if another seal uh, tries to come in to the point where they'll be like slamming into each other trying to, to uh, claim their special and particular spot on the beach. And all, uh, all sorts of seals uh, do this, but this doesn't mean that they can't be cute like this uh, baby fur seal. Also have another kind of seal, a Weddell seal with a, a pup and a, a nursing mother. And finally we have, uh, don't let the picture fool you, this is uh, the most capable and dangerous predator of all the seals, a leopard seal. Um, uh, very effective hunters, but this one's just, just chilling in the snow. All right, what questions do you have about uh, Malik, free, free lists, anything else we've been looking at? All right, I'd like to pick up one. Oh, by the way, if you need some entropy, it looks like there's some free entropy over there, just if anyone was needing that. Uh, Something that came up at the very end of last class was a bunch of things in the starter code for the Malik lab that looked like this, pound define. We've seen other places pound include, when we need to say include a header from the standard library. Uh, Anything that starts with this pound symbol is called a preprocessor directive because Early in the compilation process, before we actually get to translating the C code into assembly, we uh, get the, the compiler goes through and handles all of these preprocessor directives, different ones do different things. Uh, this pound include. Whatever comes after the pound include is some file. This just says before you actually get to compiling, just paste the contents of that file into this file. So you're usually not including header files, which just have a bunch of declarations. So you're just pasting in a bunch of declarations of standard library functions or uh, structs or functions defined somewhere else into the current file. said last time is going to be a search and, search and replace. So a way it's often used and is used in the starter code is to handle constants. So in our allocator we want to define the word size to be 8, the double word size to be 16, 
the overhead for a block to be 16, and the amount of bytes that we add using sbreak as a chunk to the heap whenever we run out of space, we define that as uh, 2 left shifted 12 times, or 2 to the 12th, uh, 4096, just to define kind of how big a chunk are we adding each time. But we can also, and so anywhere that say W size appears in our program, before it's compiled, the preprocessor will go through and replace that with eight. And it gives us a way to define a constant that doesn't involve uh, the execution of the program at all. So we're not setting a global variable equal to eight, we're not using any spot in memory to store a variable, we're just modifying the code before it's actually compiled. We can use these to approximate uh, uh, in sort of function-like behavior where if our, the thing we're defining, uh, and just by convention, these are all capital letters, they don't have to be. Uh, if we follow it with parentheses, then we can have this, say, get of some argument appear in our code somewhere, and the preprocessor will replace that with this cast to a size t pointer, dereference it, and fill in whatever p was into here. So, what I would like to start out with is have you talk with your neighbors to come up with any questions you have about these, uh, these macros, these preprocessor uh, directives, um, since you'll need to be understanding and using the ones that I have on the screen uh, in the lab. So take a few minutes, talk to your neighbors, come up with any questions you have or things you're uncertain about for, let's say. So I was getting confused about parentheses and the So, uh, an address uh, is a pointer and a pointer is an address. Those are the same things. Uh, we are casting it to a size t, which is a, a size t pointer, which is an unsigned integer that's the size of a word. And so as the comment says, these, this get and put, their point is to take some address and then to read a word, to read eight bytes or to write eight bytes to that spot. And so the first step is to take whatever address we have and cast it to something that points to an eight byte quantity. So we take P, maybe it's a car star, maybe it's a void star, we don't know what size of thing it points to given that type, I mean, uh, whatever it is, we want to use it to say read eight bytes off the heap, so we cast it to a pointer that points to something that's eight bytes and then dereference it. That's the second asterisk uh, uh, here to read eight bytes or when that dereference appears on the left side of an equals to write eight bytes to that, that spot. The other reason there are a lot of parentheses is that we're putting parentheses around all of these arguments when uh, in, the, in the definition, and that's because they aren't necessarily single variables, they can be arbitrary expressions. So someone could write something like gets a pointer plus 10, and we want to make sure that this pointer plus 10 gets executed before we do the cast or the dereference anything like that, so we put uh, this p in parentheses, so whatever expression gets filled in there is inside parentheses executed first before we then do the cast, so basically making sure it behaves 
uh, like like an argument to a function. Yeah. So the casting serves to tell us this is actually how many nodes you want to read because if you if you have a huge number of nodes, you can tell me the size of the object. Exactly. Uh, uh, both this cast and this cast here are for the purposes of controlling the behavior of the, of the pointer, whether it's how many bytes we're reading or writing, or in the case of uh, uh, casting it to a car star, we just want to cast it to something that is one byte so that when we add or subtract from it, you know, pointer arithmetic is scaled by the size of the thing we're pointing to. So if we, have, if we want to just like BP plus 10, it would actually move the address 10 times the size of whatever BP points to. So if BP was an int pointer, this would move it 10 ints down in memory. But if we actually wanted to add the value 10 to this address, <coughs> one way to do that would be to cast the pointer to a car star. So it adds 10 characters, which is just 10 bytes worth. And so these P add and P sub are for when we want to do arithmetic with pointers and we want to avoid any accidental scaling. What other questions do you have? Like, can there's like no equal sign that it implicitly return the value? So that's a good question. What are these actually, are they returning? What are they doing? Uh, and it is just taking, say, gets or puts or whatever it is and slapping in what we've defined it to be. So like if we have header of some pointer in our code, the preprocessor says, all right, this header of some argument that shows up as a define. So I'm going to replace this with P sub BP W size to subtract one word from our pointer to get to the header of uh, a block that has a payload at address BP. Then we have P sub and W size. So then P sub says. R star BP we replace W signs with eight and that also goes in parentheses. And so this is what would actually appear in the code that would be compiled. Like all of our uh, uh, macros would be, would be replaced. And so uh, we can think of it as, uh, as if, say, header P is returning the address eight bytes up, but what actually is happening is it's being replaced with code that will evaluate to that. Does that make sense? What other questions do you have? All right, one last thing we can do with our uh, preprocessor is have compilation be conditional. So I mentioned uh, last time that we have this check heap and print heap functions. They're very useful, but we only want them if we are debugging. Otherwise, they print out a bunch of stuff. They slow down our allocator. So maybe I want to both uh, print the heap and check that the heap is uh, valid at the end of the malloc function. But I want to be able to just control whether these two lines actually get compiled into, uh, into the code or not. And so I can do, there's a preprocessor directive if, I can say if debug and if, 
and then the preprocessor will check is a is there a pound defined for debug if so this code will be left in otherwise it will just not be in the version that's compiled so this means up at the top i could say define debug to be one and uh, if this line is in there, then that print heap and check heap will show up in malloc. If I comment this out, then when I compile, the print heap and check heap will not show up in malloc. They'll be uh, discarded at this preprocessing step. So it's a, it's a slightly more efficient way than including like if statements on some global variable everywhere, because again, it just happens at compile time rather than something that, that is checked at runtime. Eric. Did you say that that if statement will like run first before the rest of the code? So during the preprocessor step in compilation, the preprocessor will get to this if it has this pound. So this is like something the prepro telling the preprocessor to do something. It will say, is debug defined? If so, then keep, leave this code in. If not, don't include any of the code between the if and the end if. So if debug was not defined, the file would be compiled as if that code just wasn't in there at all. Hey. Should we always indent it? Uh, the indentation is just a kind of style thing. Okay. Uh, so if we do this, you still need to remove this because before it's made in the house. I'm wondering if it's fine, just leave it there with the computer. Uh, so uh, I think it would, it would actually be if def is the version I was talking about. Um, I think if might actually check what value debug had, whereas if def is, is debug defined at all or not. No, no, I mean, um, but yes, it, it would be fine to leave. Uh, something like this in the final uh, assignment and in particular doing all the debugging stuff like this uh, allows you to kind of easily turn debugging on and off um, uh, however, uh, uh, whenever you want. Also, the point for style, do we need to, like, do we have a check style or something like that? Uh, there is not an automated style checker with the lab. There is a style guide on the course website. Okay. Other questions? And this is literally how you would use check heap. This double underscore line will get filled in with whatever line this check heap is on. That way, if you have it multiple places in your code, the error message will tell you which line uh, check heap found a problem on. All right, let's get on with the main event for today. So computers have gotten a lot faster over the last several decades. But when we say computers have gotten faster, it matters which part of the computer we're talking about. So if we were to sketch out a graph of performance and year, let's say 1980 to 2010, and we looked at the uh, Perform, uh, the performance of our CPU in, in a log scale, we get something like something like this, where uh, our performance of our CPU for a long period of time uh, reliably doubled every few years. 
This is called Moore's Law, this idea that inevitably uh, the number of transistors on a CPU would double every few years and then our speed would, would continue to, to fall along with that. Uh, it's the performance of a individual chip has flattened out in recent years because it turns out that you, once you pack transistors too densely, it's just too hot, you can't deal with the, the heat. Um, and so uh, the number of transistors on a chip has continued on this course, but now it's because there are multiple CPUs. We have multi-core things, uh, which means the performance of a single CPU is, is no longer increasing as the, at the rate it was. But that's not the main story for today. The story is that if this line is the CPU, we have this other line, which is the speed of memory. Which means relative to how many instructions our CPU can execute uh, every second, the uh, kind of rate at which we can read and write from memory has not increased nearly as fast. And so we have this problem where any time our CPU needs to read from memory, it just takes an eternity from the CPU's perspective. Because there could be executing many, many instructions in the time it takes to, say, read a value from memory. And so this gap is, is a serious problem, and it's meant that memory has been an increasing bottleneck uh, in, uh, uh, in, in computer systems. So our view of memory uh, up until now has been something like this. Up at the top, we have our registers. Then we have memory. Our local storage, and then maybe something in the cloud that we're some data that we're accessing over the internet. And this kind of pyramid that I've drawn is what we call the memory hierarchy. Because as we go up our pyramid, our memory gets smaller, faster, and more expensive on a per byte basis. And as we go down the hierarchy, we get larger, slower, and cheaper. So we can have uh, for example, uh, 16 times 8 bytes worth of registers, uh, gigabytes of memory, terabytes of disk space on a typical, typical system. And the relative speeds accessing a register is essentially free. It takes, it, we do it as part of a single instruction. So it takes kind of no extra cycles, which is basically in executing one instruction in order to access a register. And this, the, this, the problem with this gap is that memory will take hundreds of cycles to go read a value in memory and, and get it back, or to write a value in memory. So that's 
hundreds of instructions that we could be executing while we're waiting for memory to, to get back to us. Uh, this is still better than the disk, which is going to be tens of millions of cycles to read data off of, off of our, our hard drive, off of our disk. So uh, disk compared to uh, memory, extraordinarily slow, but keeps the data around when it doesn't have electricity, and we like that. Questions on this so far? So what if we could do something in this memory region to help address this gap issue? And one way to think about this is that our CPU and memory are far away from each other. There's like, in terms of uh, the area in a computer system, this is like significant physical space and wires that we have to traverse to get between these two. They can only carry a certain amount of information. And so what if we could put something much closer to the CPU, which we'll call a cache, C-A-C-H-E, and this cache will be higher in our memory hierarchy, which means it's going to be smaller and faster than our, uh, uh, than, than our main memory here. So instead of memory, we call this kind of, the thing that we have gigabytes of, uh, uh, that takes hundreds of cycles to access, we call that main memory. The, the big central memory, and then these caches would be around 10 megabytes, so much, much smaller than main memory. And depending on the exact arrangement, something like 4 to 75 cycles to access something in our, in our cache, which, especially on the lower end, four to 10 cycles, that's an order of magnitude better than our, than our main memory. So, and one, one metaphor, CPU wants to make avocado toast, going to Google's memory is like, it has to go to the store to buy avocados. Going to disk would be like, it needs to plant an orchard to grow the avocados to then uh, turn them into, into toast and cash and be like there's an avocado in the fridge. Like very convenient, much faster than going to the store. So this is great, but we have some, some questions now. What do we put in the cache? How does having only 10 megabytes of this space actually help us? How much data does the avocado take? <laughs> Uh, depends on, on the avocado resolution. I mean, 4K avocados, they're okay. Uh, all right, so the kind of principle, both in hardware and software, that's going to make these caches actually help us out. <laughs> is the principle of locality. So this idea of locality says there's, there's two kinds, essentially. But the, the main idea is that recently used by some program is likely to be used again. 
that if we're using some variable in our program, you know, chances are it's not going to be just once. And more specifically, we have temporal and spatial locality. Temporal is this recency part that, uh, let's say, we have some for loop, and inside of this for loop, changing some element of an array to be double the amount. And so as we're repeating this loop code, we are using this variable i over and over again, the same spot in memory, or maybe in a, uh, it might be in a register. But this is a variable. We, we use it once when we're going to keep using it again many times. Do we, assuming that we have like i and plus plus in here, we're moving i one each time, is there a particular array location that we are referencing the same spot over and over? No, what are we doing with the spots in the array. Right. Yeah, well, but we're moving through the array linearly. Like the int that we, uh, if this is an int or, or whatever element this is, we access on iteration 10. We're accessing the one right next to it in iteration 11, and the one right next to that in iteration 12. And that's the spatial idea. Exactly what's happening in this for loop of an array. We're going through uh, each element of the array, and so one way our system could take advantage of this is let's say that our array starts life in main memory, and the very first time we go into the loop, we access the first element of the array. Now, the way now if we just copy that array element from main memory into our cache. We're not going to access that exact same element again, so putting it in the cache doesn't help us at all in this loop. But let's say when we access that first element, we don't copy just that one into the cache, we copy a chunk of memory, maybe 512 bytes long, from that address into the cache. Now, as we access the future elements of the array, they're in the cache, we find them much faster than we would if we had to go to memory each time. Eric? How does it determine, how, does it determine how big of a chunk to copy? Does it, is it like smarter than it look at the for loop and guess, okay, we probably need to do this many bytes? So, that is an excellent question. How does the cache know how many bytes uh, it should it should have? So uh, a particular cache has many different properties that govern the mechanics of how of how it works. Uh, we're going to avoid getting into the really precise details of like how a cache lookup works. The textbook has all the details uh, if, you're, if you're curious. Uh, but it is very important that a, a given cache has a certain block size, which is just the um,
the amount of memory, kind of the size of these chunks that are moved into and out of the cache. Sorry. How does it know if, uh, when, it, when it's running the code and stuff, how does it know whether to check the cache or main memory to see if it's there or not? How do we know whether to check cache or main memory? And the answer is we always check the cache. So when we do a memory access, uh, we're going to check the cache. If the address is present in the cache, what the thing we're looking for in the cache uh, is, we get what's called a cache hit. We find what we're looking for in the cache and we can stop looking, we send that data back to the CPU. If our address is not present, We have a cache miss. Didn't find what we were looking for in, in the cache. So then we're going to then check the next level of the hierarchy for the address we're looking for. Sorry, this might be a really stupid question. But the, the reason memory is slow because they're so far apart and cache is fast because they're so close. What is the issue of bringing the memory closer? Is it just a heating issue? Uh, so, the particular uh, issue is that um, one part is uh, the actual technology that is used for the memory up here is called SRAM. The technology that's used for main memory. DRAM, the textbook and the notes have details on what the differences between these are, but SRAM is both faster and a lot more expensive. Gotcha. Um, there's also an issue with just the bandwidth, the amount of information we can transfer across the physical wires connecting memory and the CPU. And so by kind of segregating our memory like this, we can have some, some connections that are much smaller so we can locate them uh, actually as part of the CPU itself. What do you do with data that you have to access very frequently, but you can cache it with sensitive or something? Can you like skip the check cache thing to make it faster? Or uh, what do you mean by we couldn't cache it because it's sensitive? Like say customer data or something like that, you didn't have it in the cache. So if, if we can't have it in the cache, why would we be able to have it in memory? I don't know, I think you have an example, like we have thread list, that's something that we can cache. But like we have to check every time to check if we can see the email or not check us or and we can cache that. So I was wondering like if Well I guess I, I, I think any, any any information that you could have in memory at all, you could also have in the cache. So there is no advantage in security whatsoever to do the chip. Uh, no, the, the operating system is managing all memory accesses, okay. deciding whether a program is allowed to access this address, preventing programs from reading each other's memory, okay. and then basically transparently to the program, like our code just tries to access memory at a given address okay. in C, and then the hardware is what is managing this, check the cache, is it there, if not, go to the next level. And the third step here
is to, once we find the actual address, the data that we're looking for, we then are going to take that data and the nearby data, the block uh, of data that contains the address we're looking for, and copy it back up the hierarchy on the assumption via locality that we're likely to, to want to access this data again. Yeah, Chris. Um, is the cache technically still part of the main memory? Like it's, when a computer says it has like eight gigs of RAM, does that mean the cache is like the top, like in there somewhere? Uh, good question. If, if a computer uh, says it has eight gigs of RAM, it's just main memory that's not including the caches. Um, in terms of caches, in the notes I have this diagram of uh, the Intel Core i7 and in this processor we have four different cores, four different CPUs, all of which can be executing instructions simultaneously. And inside each core, we have the x86 registers that we know and love. And then we actually have multiple levels of cache. So this kind of, that's where this, um, well, I erased it, but that's where the four to 75 cycles to access a cache is because in practice, we'll have multiple, we'll have a kind of hierarchy within this cache portion. And for the core i7, there's L1 caches, which are uh, very small and very fast. And we, these are actually separated into caches for instructions, the i cache, because when we're executing this for loop, not only are, do we have the data of i and the data of the array that is subject to locality, the set of assembly instructions that make up the loop are also are stored in memory somewhere, and we're also executing those over and over again as we iterate. So it would also be useful to put those instructions in a cache so that when we need to load an assembly instruction into the CPU, it's very fast. So there's uh, each core has a small cache for instructions, a small cache for data, and then below that, a larger L2 cache that uh, can hold both instructions and data, and then there's a larger L3 cache that's shared by all four cores on the chip. And so any memory access, check L1 cache first, then L2, then L3, then main memory, and once you find what you're looking for, you copy it back up the hierarchy so it's in all of the caches after you've accessed some, uh, uh, some address. Does like an i9 chip or whatever have like a different setup? Or? Yes, so any particular uh, uh, chip, kind of part of what you're talking about when you say the architecture of that chip or computer architecture more broadly is the design of something like this. Uh, so off the top of my head, I don't know how the i9 is different. Uh, it will, I. I'm kind of, it would still have multiple levels of cache, some shared between the cores, some not. Um, but this is part of why when we compile a program, it has to be compiled for a specific architecture. Because the arrangement of the registers, um, how you might want to optimize for the, the caching, all of that specific to a, a, a chip or, or a kind of set of chips. Other questions? Lisa? Is the information distributed like between the L1s? Oh, uh, you mean like between the L1D cache and the L1? And then L1 core 0, L1 core 2, L1. Uh, so it would, it, it's not distributed randomly. It's core 0 runs some instruction that accesses address A, the block of okay. memory around that address will end up in the caches for core zero. And so two different cores couldn't be caching the same data if they happen to be uh, both using it. Silas? So does this uh, 
everything is always gas, no matter what. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and uh, it's important to distinguish between this view of memory where we kind of are thinking about these different levels of, of caches. Each of them is uh, uh, kind of caching parts of what's in the level below uh, versus what our C code sees, which is it doesn't know anything about caches. It doesn't write any code that interacts with caches. Is all this is all happening completely transparently to the program. So you just access a memory address and through some mystical process, the data comes back to you. Oh, no. Yeah, so this is uh, a common scenario that, say, our, our L2 cache is one megabyte. Um, but we're going through, say, a two-dimensional array and an image that is uh, 100 megabytes. So we only fit kind of one megabyte worth of that array into the cache at a time. And so it might matter which order we go through the pixels in that image, because we definitely want to go through ones that are next to each other rather than just randomly throughout the image because our caches copy blocks of adjacent memory uh, um, uh, into the cache. And if you recall from our very first class, I showed you an example where there were a couple loops in Java and one which kind of went over the outer index of a two-dimensional array and, and then the inner, and then loops that did the other order. And this, just switching these loops, made the code something like 15 or 20 times slower. And that is because of caching. That is because our program like this accessed elements next to each other in memory, so when we brought a block into the cache, it made a bunch of future accesses faster. In this other version where we flip these loops, we were kind of skipping through rows of our array and our, the two integers we were accessing each time around the loop were something like uh, a thousand integers apart. And so we're never in the same block put in the cache. So we had zero benefit from the cache when we wrote the loops in the wrong order. This uh, phenomenon has uh, a particular name. Uh, we call it the stride of the code. Basically, how far in memory does it go with each memory access? So our nice loops like this that go row 0, column 0, row 0, column 1, row 0, column 2, just kind of go through our array in the order it appears in memory, that is a stride 1 program, kind of going one array element each access. This is going to maximize our locality, because every time we bring a chunk of the array into the cache, we get a bunch of cache hits. John? In this situation where we kind of can't keep in stride the code and we're kind of stuck in that worst case scenario where we're moving uh, far away from our current area over and over again. Are there, is there ever a situation like in which it would have actually been faster to just not have a cache at all? Because like the additional work of the cache is going to be slower? I mean, obviously the average time is going to be reduced. So. Uh, yes, I think that if your code has like no locality at all, it's like just a pessimal uh, memory performance, then the overhead of managing the caches is, is, a, is a loss. Uh, but I think it would be actually difficult to write code that was that poor in its memory. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, go forth and write, write the worst code anyone's ever seen. Um, and 
if we have our loops the other way, where every array axis is, say, n integers apart, we would say that is a stride n. We're kind of jumping n elements each access that's poor locality, it's going to be slower. So these kind of colors are showing the we access all the red ones and then all the yellow ones, uh, and so we're kind of jumping around in the array, um, and that's that's not taking advantage of of the caches. Yeah. Um, how do we know that this happens so the question is what's a what's a good way to kind of avoid these the, this inefficient uh, uh, memory accesses so one is just be aware of the fact that array elements arrays are laid out in contiguous chunks with like the first element then the second element then the third element uh, and if at all possible, you want to go through the array in memory order, as opposed to any time that you would be jumping around to different points of the array, then uh, uh, that's going to cause problems. Um, there are certain situations where you need to get every ounce of performance out of a piece of code that you can. And so in that case, you might need to know first how big are the caches on the particular system, how big is the data you're working with, and so you can actually figure out well, how much data can fit in a cache. This is something that uh, people programming console video games uh, at least used to have to think about a lot. Um, all consoles had not very much memory, you wanted the graphics to look as fancy as possible, so you'd know, okay, I have this struct, how many of these structs fit in the cache, and how do I manage not, um, yes, this is something I, I also, I, I should mention, our caches are small, so we can't fit all the data that we're working with in the cache at one time, necessarily, and The way that this is typically handled <laughs> is through what's called the eviction policy, which is our cache is full, we're bringing some new block of data in, what should we replace? What should we kick out of the cache? So eviction or Replacement policy, another term for it. And a very common one is least recently used, or LRE. So we're bringing some data into our cache. It's full. We need to replace something. We're going to choose the block of data that was accessed least recently and the cache itself will be keeping track uh, or keeping an approximation of what the least recently used block of data was. Eric? Are there cases where you need to like manually clear because like vaguely you can just think of like cache full layers and sometimes you have to clear? So at least in, um, so the, the, the C and assembly instructions uh, that we've been working with don't have any way to directly interact with the cache. This is just managed at the hardware level. It makes a memory access, and then after that, it's out of the program's hands. Uh, so a program might need to be aware of when a memory access might replace something in the cache that it still needs, but uh, a program won't be sort of manually saying, all right, I, I want to clear the cache, although it could effectively do that by just making a bunch of other memory accesses to replace what was ever in the cache before. There are certain specialized caches managed by the operating system that the operating system does need to clear uh, at certain points just so that one program doesn't end up using memory addresses that 
another program could cache. Um, but uh, from what we're talking about today, no, we're never like manually telling the cache to do any particular thing. Other questions? All right. I think that that will do it for today. We'll end a couple minutes early. Enjoy your Friday. Get started on the, the Malik Lab. There will be a quiz out on Monday as usual. Um, and uh, we'll get to virtual memory starting on Monday. I will see you then.